Rice of Rice Psychology Group to join us tonight for a, a discussion, a chat. This is uh, just, we want to answer all of your questions and just kind of offer some ways to help you and your family learn how to cope during this unprecedented time. I mean, Dr. Rice, we're just going to get right. First of all, I want to ask, how are you doing through all of this? I know this has completely upended all of our lives. It, you know, it has. I moved uh, from two office locations in Tampa to my kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, it pushed me to learn how to do telehealth and virtual sessions. And it's been a huge change. And I'm working off the kitchen table, which is a little bit different. And, you know, seeing everybody virtually. So I'm doing okay, doing my best to offer support where I can. And we're all learning as we're going. And that, and it just, it really did happen so suddenly. And I think maybe that's why so many of us are dealing with that deep anxiety and that stress of the time that we're living in right now. I mean, what sort of impacts are you seeing? Well, I think the not knowing, you know, so I decided uh, to go virtual on the 16th, which is about when other people were making the change too. But the Friday morning before that, we were going to stay open. And then by Friday afternoon at Rice Psychology, we collectively made the decision to go virtual. And then, you know, maybe it's going to be, we don't know how long, maybe till April 15th, maybe till Easter, and now into May. And so, you know, I'm doing fine with coping with the not knowing. It's our new normal. And so, you know, trying to just say, we're going to take it one day at a time and, look ahead and plan ahead to the extent that we can and look at, see what is under my control or our control and what isn't. And like, I'm kind of into the serenity prayer these days, which is knowing what you can control, knowing what you can't, changing what you can and accepting the rest and figuring out how to really accept the rest. Yeah. That's one piece of advice that my dad always taught me to that prayer that you just kind of, cause there, there are so many things that are out of our control and, you know, just from a parent standpoint, you know, the parent needs to be okay for the family to be okay. What are some coping mechanisms that we can deal with? You know, not only are many of us working from home, maybe a parent has lost their job or there's that uncertainty of whether their business is going to survive this. Uh, what is your advice on how we can make ourselves as whole as we can be for our families? We've learned the value of meditation and mindfulness. And if you're somebody who already knows how to do this and maybe you've stopped your practice, uh, get back into your practice of doing that because it's a way of starting your day and clearing your head and allowing yourself to focus. A lot of parents when they're working will get up early and you know work out or get their shower and get themselves ready before their kids even get up. That's another suggestion because even though the kids are working from home, they still need you to be present and not crazy stressed and trying to do everything at one time as they try to figure out how to do online schooling, which is hard. And so if you can find time and places to take care of yourself to be okay, to sort of replenish yourself, you're going to be more available and able to be patient with your kids. And I think that's really important. If there's two of you at home and you can trade kids or you can trade, you have the kids now, I need a break, you know, do what you can to support each other and take care of yourselves. Because we know that you got to put the oxygen mask on yourself before you put it on your child or as Southwest would say, your spouse. Yeah. Um, yeah. On you fly. So the same thing goes here. Make sure you have oxygen. And, you know, you kind of brought up the, you know, we don't really want to call it homeschooling. It is what it is, but it's not, it's not exactly that true definition of homeschooling. Our children are e-learning. The parent has, in a way, kind of become a teacher. It's been a really hard couple of days for parents. This is that first week that we've really delved into it officially. You know, what do we do to kind of set that routine? I mean, I know my own son will start the morning crying and trying to fight it because he's just not used to to learning from mom and dad? Well, so they're learning sort of from their <laughs> sort of from mom and dad, right? So you at least mm -hmm. don't have to create the curriculum. You don't have to create the lessons, but you are trying to teach new math. Yeah. And you are trying to teach common core stuff, which doesn't make sense to most people who weren't educated in common core, right? So it's like you're teaching Greek some of the time and understand that. And so cut yourselves as parents some slack because this is really hard, mm -hmm. okay? And nobody knows how to use the technology. Like the kids know how to do it as well as anybody. <laughs> nobody knows how to use it. And understand that. And 
I think we have to adjust our expectations. So right now, especially if you have an elementary or middle school child, don't tell them this, but the grades don't matter that much. True. Make sure your kids are involved in some learning activities each day and maybe are getting the gist of what you what they're supposed to be learning. But you know, your relationship with your child is the most important thing. And so we have to be reasonable about this um, and let them know that right now, learning how to learn in this way maybe is our goal for this week. It's not yeah. perfect completion of, of things. And if it glitches and you miss social studies today, that's okay. Yeah. We're going to figure out together how to make it up. Yeah, very true. And if, you know, we are starting that morning, should we, if the child is complaining or crying or just really upset, should we continue to push them or maybe just wait, take a break and then come back to it? What do you think is the best way to work around this? Well, I, you know, I think you ha it's a case by case basis for sure. And some kids are expected to show up for a Zoom class and other kids are just expected to complete a packet by the end of the day or the end of the week. So I think you can take some of those things in mind and uh, perhaps the child can show up for the lesson, but do the work later. Or if, you know, maybe first thing in the morning isn't your child's best time. And, and so maybe you got to sit down and say, hey, tomorrow morning when, you know, you're not really wanting to start school, what can I do to help you? What can I do to make this better for you? Let's come up with a plan to make it a little bit more, I'm going to say palatable, but a little bit more manageable. True. And I mean, have you been having more parents reaching out to you just out of curiosity that are we, I know we're all dealing with this because we're seeing it on social media. It's almost become we're we all know we're in the same boat here. And I, and I hope everybody takes a little bit of comfort from that. Like nobody's got this under control, not the private yeah. schools, not the public schools, not nobody. Yeah. So mm -hmm. like, it's okay that this is a debacle. And, yeah. you know, I don't, you know, it's, I, I'm sort of aware of, I don't know how many people we're talking to, but you know what, if it's not working so well this week, that's okay. Yeah. Like, this is not going to make or break your child's future. If the first week of April, your child doesn't shine during pandemic school. Yeah. This is that's, okay. a, that's a good way. That's what we should call it now because that truly, I mean, this isn't just our community. It's not just our state. It's not just our country. It's an entire world dealing with this right now. It really is. And I think really it's all like, let's just take a deep breath and know that the teachers are working, you know, so hard to put lessons together um, that make sense and that are relevant. And let's just support the kids to do what they can. And, you know, this is stressful. So if you have a very social child, they really might be hurting right now. If you have yeah. a very socially anxious child, they may be terrifically in their element right now. <laughs> yeah. It's true. I know. I think there are a lot of us introverts who are really enjoying it to a, to a point, to a point. Uh, just because, you know, there is a lot of anxiety, of course, going on around this right now. But that is a, a very good point. And, you know, when it comes to that, I mean, it is just human nature to want to be around other people. And explaining that to our child, I know it's hard for my son, so his little friend down the street, so I'm sorry, buddy, but we just can't, we can't play right now. Uh what's the best way to maybe explain this to our kids, you think? Okay, I think right now this is the hardest thing to explain without scaring them and without making them feel like, well, other people aren't really dirty or dangerous. We don't really know. And we're, you know, we're staying home just to keep ourselves safe because we don't know, you know, who has this and who doesn't. And we're just learning about how people catch it. And so maybe you can explain that like during this learning period, when we're learning about um, how this virus gets passed from person to person, we're doing the safest thing, which is to stay home in the same way that if you had the flu or you had a cold, you wouldn't go breathe on anybody if you knew that that's how they could catch it. So, you know, we're not prisoners. We're not locked in our homes. We can go in the backyard. We can sit on the front porch. But, you know, for right now, all of our social stuff needs to be virtual you know, and, and I think that that's how we have to do it in a way that seems safe, that seems time limited um, and gives them alternatives because the alternatives are key, you know. So, yeah, for example, yeah. you know, a, a socially a, a child who's feeling really cut off and bored and lonely, something that, you, you know, we set up um, and it's an elementary school child who isn't playing multiplayer games on Xbox because he just doesn't really have to do all that. Yet, right. So the parents are reaching out to other parents to try to set up some tournaments. 
and to help those kids figure out how to connect with each other. Yeah, that's a good idea, actually, because it, you know, and speaking of, though, you know, kind of mentioned those games and screen time. Screen time is something we've talked to you a lot about over the years. Is this kind of the time? I mean, I know we try to say we should limit it, but should we relax those rules a little bit right now during pandemic parenting? I, I think that, you know, you do what you can to get yeah. here to there. So and I so again, I think the key is still moderation, but it's also survival. So if you're a parent who is working from home and you are in meetings all day, right? Maybe the night before you come up with some ideas, you make sit down with your child and make a schedule um, so that they have activities to do. And you know what I've been doing with some patients is brainstorming activities. And it's neat because they're connecting with things that they used to enjoy doing, um, like painting and puzzles and um, crafts and all sorts of things that, you know, they haven't done for years because every spare minute is filled up with technology. So I think that people are, have to be more relaxed with that, but you also can say, look, if you're going to be on it, let's make sure we're not only playing first person yeah. games. Let's make sure that there's variety, um, and keep an eye on it and still make sure that they wind down before they go to sleep and all that. But mm-hmm. I think that we're in, um, let's just get from here to there without, proverbially, you know, proverbially <laughs> killing each other. So I think that it probably is going to mean um, a bit more tech for everyone. I've been online. I mean, my phone yeah, is like all been online a lot today. Mm-hmm. I've yeah. been online today. <laughs> and, you know, speaking of even our own time, I mean, I'm sure reading the news, being on social media a lot does kind of impact our levels of anxiety. What's your advice? For, it's really hard to separate yourself because the news is changing so quickly and so fast. What's your advice to mom and dad, caregivers, grandparents out there on keeping ourselves sane when it comes to screen time? Uh, Less is more. One suggestion I have is if you want to watch in the morning to see what happened overnight, watch for an hour in the morning. And then if you're a person like I like to watch, I I haven't been able to always, but like I like to watch that six o'clock press conference to see what's going on. And then I like to see the talking heads talk about it so that I can see if my interpretation matches (laughs) what they say. And um, and then be done with it, uh, or, you know. Or what are your reputable sources? Um, but let's try to limit it and not have it on all day. Or if you have it on all day, have it on privately in your bedroom and not in the family room. The kids don't need to hear it all the time because it's yeah. it can be traumatizing for the kids to hear this because they're not going to understand all of it and they're going to snippets of it and then they're going to jump to conclusions and may become even more anxious. And I, you know, the scenes in the emergency yeah. rooms are terrifying. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's true. we have, and we, and if the kids are seeing stuff like that, let's talk about it, right? And why are we staying home? We're staying home because we want to stay out of hospitals because we want to stay healthy. It's really busy there. They don't need our broken arm and they don't need us right now to have other kinds of accidents or to add to the number of patients that they're seeing. They have a lot on their hands. Yep. That is very true. And, you know, and if our child is, you know, maybe they did see something or they're talking on, because uh, they're social distancing, but talking on the computer with their friends, uh, if the child is afraid. And I feel like the younger kids, I saw this somewhere where they weren't so worried about the younger kids because these kids are finally getting more time with their parents than they've ever had before. And I am here. They're kind of off that hamster wheel of life, right? Yeah. But I'm, the- I'm hearing that's a, I feel like that's, that's one of the pots at the end of this rainbow is so much more family time, especially parents who are able to really carve it out, even if they are working. It's so powerful. And, you know, the importance of setting a routine. I'm sure we always talk about this with kids too, but during this time, um, you know, what do you think is best right now in general? I know it's hard because every family is different, whether we're working from home or we we're just home with the kids all day. I think they really need some structure and some expectations. Again, know your child, because if you have a really argumentative, strong-willed child, it's going to be extra important to make that. <laughs> I love your TP. I have to hear about the, the Oh, of- yes. My kids, that's like their reading spot. Up, so this is our, you know, it's funny. We have a very small house. It's a very open floor plan. So we are around each other all the time. But the one benefit is we have this office space above our garage. It's kind of like our our hut, our little area to escape. So that's why it's so quiet here. Normally it's like chaos in my house. I love, I love it. It's horrible. Yeah. yeah, It's horrible. But in terms of a schedule, yeah. The part of the reason that a school day happens the way it happens is that there's a schedule, right? Mm -hmm. And activities have a beginning and an end time. 
and they build in breaks and they build in time to pass from one subject to another. And, and, and it's really helpful. And when kids don't have that, especially when the days are really long now, right? They're getting up at yeah. seven or eight in the morning and you're working at home or you're out working until five or six, like they're going stir crazy. Like that's a long time for kids to be responsible to fill their own time and structure for themselves. So if you have um, like a whiteboard or you have an easel or, or even just a piece of paper, write a schedule with them. If they have a school schedule, work off of that and help them to structure their day. We created centers today with somebody that I spoke to. And so building an optical obstacle course outside, instead of just playing with the dog, teach the dog, a tr like watch a video on YouTube about training your dog and then try to teach your dog that trick. Um, jigsaw puzzle. Um, playing outside, not with the dog, um, painting. Oh, I used to like to, you know, stuff like that. So we really want to dig deep and make sure they have activities to do, mix it up with their schooling. Um, some kids are discovering that they actually like to read when it's not required. So that's a, that's a bonus. Yeah, that is true. And just like even the, the new board games, I mean, we're kind of pulling out everything right now. There are everything out of the garage that we haven't had for years. And I know a lot of us are doing that right now. And I like uh, what Rebecca Gonzalez just uh, posted here. She said that she uses a timer all day, that it works wonders for her preschooler. And she's a teacher, so she probably knows uh, a lot about how to do that, to, or like just like keeping the kid on schedule. But that's a, it's a good idea. Oh, I, am, I, I have timers for myself. I have um, an app that you, a free app that you can get on your phone called the time timer and it counts down the time so the kids can see it. So if this is the time, like, like maybe a 15 minute, so you get like a 15 minute cone. And then as it gets used up, the cone gets smaller and smaller. So it's a visual clock um, and they sell them for real. Like you can buy the appliance or you can just use the app and it's really helpful. But timers are great because it gives kids a sense of a beginning and an end. Um, you know, and we often think, oh, kids with attention and learning problems need more time. And sometimes they do, but sometimes, especially the kids with attention problems, they need less time and they need yeah. to know no pressure's on because if they have only a short amount of time to do it, they may be able to get started. It may turn their brains on and they may be able to perform more efficiently. But I'm a huge fan of timers and clock <laughs> and love that. So I know you kind of mentioned it with like apps too. Do you have any other favorite apps that you want to share with parents that you think might be really helpful to help us get through this time right now? Uh, yeah, I'm taking a lot of um, pictures on my phone and sharing pictures because when we're having, if you're not using Zoom, so you can't share your screen, um, it, it can be kind of complicated. So I'm using uh, just like I'm taking a ton of pictures and texting them and emailing them as sort of supportive information uh, to help myself get through. Um, I'm trying to think, of course, I left my phone inside and I would need to go through. <laughs> and I can't, you know, yes, I have a million yeah. that I'm using and I can't think of any of them because you asked me about it. So I yeah, no worries at all. It's fine. I had to get up because as the sun's setting, I'm realizing that the lighting is all, it's all these things that we're learning how to do. We're learning on the fly, right? On just everything that's happening right well, now. Well, I, you know, I guess the other app that I use uh, tremendously is Audible because I am okay. a huge fan of audiobooks. Um, when I walk the dog, I listen in the car, I listen, and it's really convenient to have the app on my phone so that I can pick up where I left off. If I'm listening on any device, it syncs. So, um, I love, love, love my audiobooks, and I am addicted to them. And it probably just takes the brain off of all of those thoughts and just thinking about what's going on in the world right now. It's probably a nice escape that we it's should. Yeah, it's a lovely escape. I mean, I'm listening to a lot of nonfiction and stuff, but if you are a person who finds some fiction or stories or biographies that you like, it's just a sigh of relief to jump into somebody else's life. And it's different yeah. than watching a video. Somehow it feels like you're reading. And so it feels productive and healthy and not screen sucking and you're learning things and um, you're using your imagination. And I just think it's lovely. You know, I know for, you know, going back into this time that we're living in right now, and even for the most emotionally stable person right now, this has completely has us off of our feet right now. At what point do you think 
when we need to kind of realize maybe we do need to seek some professional help. Um, I, any talking in general for everybody is going to help, but there has to be a point where we're all going to, I mean, I know I find myself on that emotional roller coaster. And at what point do we need to make that call? So we're going to want to keep our eyes open for really bad anxiety and depression. So for depression, um, it's not just a bad day. It's about, you know, two weeks is kind of where we draw the line. Although if you feel it coming on, you don't have to wait two weeks. You know, changes in sleep habits, eating, feeling um, maybe hopeless, uh, lacking confidence, feeling guilty about things, feeling like things, everything's your fault, you're not capable. Um, feeling sad, tearful, um, less interested in your partner, um, and just that really general sense of malaise, um, even feeling like I don't want to live anymore, it's not worth it. So those are some signs of depression. And if you see, if you hear it in your kids, in, in kids and teens, it can show up more as irritability, social isolation. Um, for kids and adults, things that used to be fun aren't fun anymore. It's a fancy word, word called anhedonia, where we just things just aren't fun anymore. So those are some yeah. of the signs uh, for depression. And then for anxiety, um, it can be that knot in the pit of your stomach, um, that rumination is just endlessly going around and around and around. And you know, you you go to sleep and you're upset and you have a knot in your stomach and you wake up and it's right there. And and you're, you're what if, what if, what if, those, those questions and restlessness, both anxiety and depression can uh, lead to significant trouble concentrating. Um, you know, like it's not worth it. You know, like there's no point in getting dressed in the morning, maybe even lapse of, you know, good hygiene. So we're thinking at Rice Psychology of offering like um, maybe a succession group uh, to help people with some of these things. Like how do you address anxiety and the signs of anxiety and depression to ward them off. It's almost like we can't inoculate ourselves against Corona virus, but we can inoculate ourselves against depression and anxiety. And that's what we want to do before it knocks us over because we all have to keep our heads above water one way or another. Yeah. Yeah. And really this is impacting everybody. I don't think that there is anybody who is not impacted or feeling some sort of anxiety from all of this right now. And just maybe picking up the phone. I know we're so isolated from our friends right now and just how important that is, like encouraging people, especially calling the grandparent. And I, like know, I, wanted, to, and I wanted to speak to the grandparents because my guess is that a lot of people who are listening to us today are deal, are that sandwich generation where they're dealing with their kids and they're dealing with their parents. And that's a lot to, to juggle, especially if your parents are getting older. And so having patience and understanding for your parents and making sure you're reaching out to them every day to say, hi, how are you doing? And spend some time. Like I'm working on not rushing off the phone. You know, I see my mom a lot and she's a really, really important person in my life. But sometimes I find that I'm not patient enough. And I really want to be patient and helpful and be a support for her. Uh, because I kind of feel like she took care of me my whole life and, you know, it's our turn and, you know, keeping in mind that the technology is 10 times harder for them than it is for you in the same ways that you're probably not as good as Xbox, at Xbox as your kids are. Yeah. That's how they feel. And so, um, it's a lot on the generation again, that's probably watching this, um, so take care of yourselves. You have a lot on your plates, but we need to be kind to the kids and the grandparents. Yes, that is true. To everybody, to the neighbors, it's, uh, right. we're all feeling it. We are all going through this together. I know that's something that we're hearing from, ev like every news station is saying it. And it just, the unprecedented times right now. I mean, how has this changed your field and how do you think it's going to change it moving into the future? Because everything is probably because of social distancing has to be virtual. Right. Right. So for us, we have, uh, you know, there's been some changes in terms of regulations. And so we have a little more freedom with the types of technology that we're able to use to offer therapy. We, we at Rice Psychology didn't use to offer initial sessions um, virtually, and now we are. So we are accepting new patients and we have availability for new patients with 
male and female therapists, we, I'm surprised that I'm doing therapy with six and seven year olds and having so much fun doing it. And it's been really helpful. It's been easier to have the parents included in sessions because everybody's home. And so to yeah. come for 10 or 15 minutes of a session isn't such a big deal. But, you know, it has pushed me over that hurdle of offering this and learning about it and becoming comfortable. Frontier and I are soon going to have a discussion so that I can yeah. improve my uh, speed of connection. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so I think that um, we're going to, I think that as we get through this, we're going to become not experts, but much, much better at doing things virtually. And I think we're probably going to continue to offer it because you know, it, it, it's another avenue. It's not the same as being in a room with people, but, you know, traffic is terrible at five o'clock in the evening when you're driving from North Tampa to South Tampa or vice versa. Oh and if God. you can go home and have therapy and then have dinner, it's a delight. Yeah. It's wonderful. Absolutely. So I think that um, more of our field, unfortunately, you know, we do a lot of um, testing for learning disabilities and ADHD and gifted stuff. And we're really wanting to wait to be able to be in the same room for most of that because we don't, you know, the to be able to use some of these measures virtually, um, you know, it's just not the same. We're not we we aren't there yet. And, you know, what you bring up the, the learning disabilities uh, for parents of children who like what, what's your advice for them? I know they're trying to work with the schools, but um, you know, this again, it's just, it's hard on everybody, but what, what would you tell that parent? On well, again, yeah. it, okay. First of all, be kind to yourself, be kind to your child. Yeah. You know, in the best of circumstances, if you're a child with a learning disability, school's going to be harder than it is for, you know, typically achieving and typically learning peers, right? So we're going to cut those kids a little bit of slack while encouraging them to learn. You know, if the problem is a reading disability, then maybe you're going to step up and you're going to do more reading with the child, more reading for the child. You're going to help them access their um, books online because a lot of the textbooks are online. There's accessibility things on your computer and you can get it to read, you know, sections of the textbook. You can adjust the speed that it reads. You can get um, audiobooks. You can get them through the library. And there is um, a website, a program called Learning Ally, A-L-L-Y. And if your child has a, learning, a diagnosed learning disability, you can apply to Learning Ally to be able to get significantly reduced audiobooks. It used to be recordings for the blind and dyslexic. And if you have um, a clinician who diagnosed your child, they can certify your membership and you get some discounts. And it's a great uh, resource for families um, of children who have uh, reading or vision difficulties. And, you know, just I want to go back to just because, you know, we've got a, probably a few more people have joined us that new area and we hate to call it homeschooling, the e-learning uh when, school at home. Uh, it's school at home, exactly. And I've seen it over and over. We, we're experiencing it here at my house. The mornings are really hard to get started because they're just not in the routine. How long does it take for a child, maybe we could say, to establish a routine where it just becomes part of every day, where they maybe won't fight it as much? Right. And I wish I could give you a time. I think a lot of it depends on... Um, the child's temperament is your is do you have a child who is adaptable who typically handles change really well do we do do you as a parent know what you're doing because yeah. i think that nobody knows what they're doing and so mm -hmm. having a child get used to a routine that isn't a routine it's not a routine yeah <laughs> it's not a routine. So the more you can kind of make it up or make up a routine and make up a routine that maybe mm -hmm. gives enough leeway for things not working, you know, so I think, you know, for some kids, it's going to be two days and they're going to be Johnny on the spot, ready to work, you know, itching for what's going to come today. Mm -hmm. And other kids are going to want to crawl into that teepee behind you. And just, <laughs> you know, I think we have to take it one child at a time, but the more the adults in the house can help create an inviting space for the kids, the more we can help to break tasks down into manageable steps. Um, maybe you have a child who's good once they get started, but getting started is a nightmare. Yeah. And 
that child, you're going to sit with them for the first item or two and help them get started and like, be, wow, you're really figuring this out. And you're going to catch them being good and catch them trying and say, I'm going to write a note to Mrs. So-and-so. She's going to be so impressed with how quickly yeah. you come on to this. Um, you know, you know, like you get notes home about your child and it's like bad, bad, bad. Right. And then yeah. you get a good note and your child and you are walking on water and everyone goes out for ice cream <laughs> under normal circumstances. <laughs> Catch your kids being good and, you know, get excited and show up with a positive attitude and energy and can't wait to see what you're going to learn today as best you can. <laughs> you got to have that. Yeah. We're like, I know if we, if we have that bad day, as you said, just be kind to yourself, kind to your child. Right. I mean, if we have a bad day with that homeschooling just or e-learning, just step away. Right. Just let them and take a break. Nothing's going to happen. You just, but I think every day is a new day. And so if it didn't go so well today. It doesn't mean it's never going to go well. We want to reframe it and we want to use that not yet. Right. Okay. So we haven't mastered this yet. We'll try yeah. again tomorrow. And maybe we need to make it a little bit more bite sized tomorrow or a little friendlier tomorrow. Or let's find a different chair that will be more comfortable. I, you know, I don't know. Yeah. We, we just, we just got to keep trying until yeah. we out what works you know obviously it can't all be you know roses and sunshine and sometimes we do have to set limits and say you know you know when you do x you'll be able to do y which i prefer when this happens then this happens rather than you can't do this if you don't do that that feels really negative right you know when then is a whole lot um, more appetizing to a child True. And that can maybe just saying, you know, I've got to do this conference call and then, you know, so just kind of setting your, cause obviously we have work we have to get done too. And I think that's been the really hard part for a lot of parents where you're trying to do your work and have your child set up to do their stuff. And it's. And depending on your work, there's some families who can all kind of be at the dining room table together and working together. And it's inspiring for kids to see mom and dad working too, provided you have a child who can work quietly sure. and you're on a conference call. So that's something, or if you have a quiet task that you can do work with them because then they're not alone, you know, and all of that. And so that's one way to address this. You know, when your kids are babies, you nap when they nap, right? Yeah. You also shower when they're napping. And, you know, so some parents I know are finding that their teachers are doing a great job and they're able to do some work while the kids are on their calls and doing school. And other families have to be present when the kids are doing school and then they can work when the kids have breaks. So there's for sure not a one size fits all. And I, I think that's the most important takeaway. Is so top three, I mean, tips and recommendations on, we'll just again, go back to that parent, how we can deal with this stress. If there were three things that you could, that we could take away from this on helping us cope so we can help our children cope. Okay. Or maybe it's not three things. It can be more than that. It can be less than that, but just uh, because we are dealing with, we keep saying this word unprecedented times right now. It's hard. You know, I'm, I have like a thousand tips, but, you yeah. know, three most, I think, again, I think the most important thing is remember that your relationship with your child trumps school. Yeah. Number one. And so compassion, adaptability, empathy, it's got to be more important right now than grades because we don't even know what grades are going to count. Yeah. Uh, I think that's the first thing. The second thing is for parents um, make if you can, and everybody can't because everybody doesn't have childcare and everybody doesn't have somebody to help them. If there's any way that you can carve a little time out for yourselves, hopefully your kids sleep. Maybe it's not until nine o'clock at night or maybe it's at 5.30 in the morning, but carve a little time out for you to make you feel good. Get dressed in the morning, wash your hair if you can. Do something to take care of yourself. If it's a, gla a glass of wine in the evenings, right? You can't drink yourself into oblivion because that's not gonna work for anybody, but you know, do what makes you feel good a little bit of the time. And the last recommendation I'd say is have fun. Mm -hmm. Build in time to laugh and play Barbies and draw and dig out Twister and be silly and make up skits and play video games with your kids. Have fun with them. This is an amazing time to reconnect with your kids. So 
Yeah. I'd say yeah. that those are my three tips. I love that. That's a hundred. And it, we're basically reliving our childhoods, but for our kids, because it's, it is our lives now. It, it is like a rat race. It's a hamster wheel. That's what I used to compare my, my daily schedule to. And it's been nice to just sit back and play grocery store with my four-year-old. I Aww, love that. Yeah. You know, Maybe. you know, thing, um, <laughs> I know. I don't, in the teepee. Uh, it's the, the relationships with the spouses too. Uh, we are all of a sudden around their spouse all of the time. Any advice for the husbands and wives and significant others out there on surviving this? Because I think I read, and I don't know if it's true, that the divorce rate in China has gone up since the outbreak. Uh, you know, I haven't read that. I mean, I think the word on the street is there's either going to be more divorces or more babies. Or more babies. And I would like to see more babies. Right. The- um, I, I, so I, I have a couple of thoughts about that. The first thing is remember why you got with your partner in the first place. Mm-hmm. Remember that you found, remember what qualities you found endearing and what you loved about that person and why you are with that person. (laughs) Try the more we focus on the positive characteristics of ourselves and others, the better we're going to feel. And the more we focus on the annoying things, the more annoyed we're going to feel. So if you can sort of say, okay, you know, that the way he breathes, whatever. (laughs) But it's okay. I still love him anyway. (laughs) Right. So I think we really have to focus on, okay, but I love his sense of humor and I love how he plays with the kids. And so that's the first thing. Remember why you got together in the first place and try to remember the things you love about your partner. Second is we speak nicely to each other, say please, um, curb the sarcasm. Sarcasm is so hurtful and so biting and the person who's dishing it out might think it's funny, but I can tell you your children and your spouse oftentimes feel that it's at their expense and it's going to make them feel sad and bad. And so if there's a way to curb the sarcasm, I recommend that. And the last thing is try to be helpful to each other because, uh, typically partners are more interested in intimacy when the dishes are done and when you are, it's very um, romantic to yeah. clean the kitchen up together mm-hmm. and not, you know, it limits some of the resentment that can happen. True. So. Awesome. I know, and thank you so much, by the way, I know we've talked about so many different topics here yeah. and people will be able to go back and um, review this again, but how can people get in touch with you? I know you work with all your group, all ages and we do. situations. How can people reach out and get in touch with you? Um, thanks for asking. So we have a website. It's ricepsychology.com. Psychology is a very long word to spell. Yeah. Um, P-S-Y-C-H-O-O-G-Y. Yeah. Anyway, it's rice psychology, rice like the food. And um, you can reach out to us that way. Uh, we've been doing uh, Facebook Live every day on our Facebook page at about noon. And then we've been showing up on Instagram at 3.45 or 4. And so those are some ways you can, you know, catch us. Um, but really, the, our, our phone number is on our website. Um, send us an email. Um, you can reach out to me at Dr. Rice, Dr. Rice at ricepsychology.com. We're doing a parent group, a Zoom call on Thursday. Yeah, and talk about that a little bit more. What, what can we expect with that? Sure. So since uh, the fall, I think this is our sixth meeting, we created something called the Parent Clubhouse. And it's at seven o'clock for about an hour, the first Thursday of the month. And it was in person until this month where it will be virtual. (laughs) And it's just a support group time. It's free to the community, to anybody to drop in and talk about parenting, talk about your concerns. It sprang out of, we were, we showed a movie called Screenagers several years ago. Mm -hmm. Then there's a follow-up to that movie, which focuses on kids' mental health in like this digital age and what we can do to support them. And after we would show these movies and have discussions, everybody wanted to continue the discussions because they were so rich. Yeah. And I, I need, we needed a place to go to continue the discussions. And so that's really what it grew out of. There aren't a lot of free parent uh, support groups in yeah. Tampa. And so we just wanted to offer uh, something to the community to give people a place to uh, drop in and, you know, 
um, be with other parents and share ideas with with licensed psychologists and yeah. you know who can you know help them know is this really serious and do we need to get some follow up care or you know can we just you know figure out other ways to do it so that's what it is and so we're going to continue it for as long as people want it and it's definitely i think there's a need for it now more than ever and i think you know as we kind of close out here just letting people know that you know it's okay to not be okay right now but it's very important that if you feel like you need help or if your loved one needs help to reach out right yeah, and if it's a crisis, you can still in, in Tampa, you know, the crisis center at two one one. I'm, I'm, I haven't checked recently, but I'm sure they're still fielding calls. So if it's an emergency, um, and you really feel like you know you or a loved one are in danger, call the crisis center and you know, or suicide hotline. Uh, you know, there's national support. Um, if it's not an emergency, call us. Yeah. And you know, lots and a very skilled um, mental health providers in the Tampa Bay area. And I know we're all doing our best to support people through this time. And there's no shame in it at all. No, I've had about a million years of therapy. So, uh, <laughs> you know, puts me in a good position to not judge yeah. anybody. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time. We really do appreciate it. Hopefully we can chat again here in the next few weeks. And I know this is, we're in this for the long haul. Uh, thank you for thinking of me, Laura. Gonna, it's going to be a while, exactly. But it's uh, this is the virtual village, and we hope to keep everybody together and and learning. So thank you so much, and everybody have a great night, and uh, we'll see you all soon. Thank you, Dr. Rice. We do appreciate. Bye, it. Thank you, Laura. Okay, bye.